Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together as a church family, as friends, as followers of you. Thank you that we can lift you up in worship, that we can look into your word, that we can learn more about you, and Father, hopefully develop our relationship with you a little bit more this morning. God, I pray that as we take a look at Christ our coming King, that you would guide our conversation, that you would lead us through uh, the insights that you want us to gain this morning. And Father, most of all, we just pray that you would be glorified in this place. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. As we get going this morning, I want to ask you, have you ever hoped for anything that you weren't sure you would ever see come to fruition? I mean, do we have any Flames fans in the house? (laughs) Do you really think we're ever going to see another Stanley Cup here? Not looking that good. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, so I pretty much reserved myself or accepted the fact that I'm never going to see another Super Bowl championship with my team. But there's lots of things in our life that we hope for and we, we so earnestly or so badly want to see come to fruition, but we don't know that we ever will. This morning we're going to take a look at a quick little video clip about a guy named Reuben Carter. Now Reuben Carter was an uh, up-and-coming boxer in New Jersey in 19-something-66-ish. And... Reuben was falsely accused of a triple murder in New Jersey. And the clip that we're going to watch right now comes from the movie The Hurricane. And this is the moment where we see Reuben Carter develop hope for something he hopes comes to fruition. Take a look. So how we get to this part in the story, um, if you're not familiar with this movie, is a young boy reads... Reuben Carter's autobiography that he wrote from prison. And through reading that autobiography comes to the realization that, you know what, I don't, I don't think he's actually guilty. And so his, uh, his friends that we saw there talking on the phone, those are some Canadians that he's enlisted, this young boy is enlisted to help him with Reuben's case. And this moment that we just witnessed is the moment right before Carter's case is reopened because of the diligent efforts of this uh, young person who read his book and his friends. And when Carter's case is reopened, the courts come to a verdict that, that say that Carter's uh, conviction was based on grave constitutional violations, that Carter was commuted of the charges, and after his release, Carter became famous for the saying, hate got me into this place, love is going to get me out. Or love got me out. See, we witnessed this moment that Carter said gave him hope that he may actually one day taste freedom. Now, as Christians, we have the ultimate hope. And that ultimate hope is found in the person of Jesus. And as we finish this series, Jesus is more than enough We're talking about Christ our coming King, and I feel like at this moment I should probably issue a disclaimer. So now what you're thinking is, "Uh uh-oh, I've never heard a preacher issue a disclaimer before. Um, When we talk about Christ the coming King, there are lots of different viewpoints. There are lots of theories and different theologies built around what this will look like. And this morning, I would rather us not focus on those kind of things but focus on what we can, we can glean from Christ's second coming. So let me just preface this with, I'm probably going to say something you don't agree with. <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know. Um, but our coming king is a phrase that elicits certain feelings within me. Because when I was a teenager and an early college student, I went through this stage where I was absolutely fascinated by the end times. Anybody else? Anybody else do that? Come on, let's see those hands. Everybody in the first service was. Like a quarter of you guys? Come on, I don't buy that. Anyway, I was enthralled with prophecies. And the book of Revelation, which, you know, really seems like nobody understands. But I wanted to know when Christ would come back. 
Even though the Bible reminds us that no one but the Father knows, not even the Son, when that will take place. I worked at Christian Publications when I was going through college, so I had the opportunity to read or at least look at books that uh, were coming in all about this topic. And I gravitated to a couple uh, covers that caught my attention, uh, books written by a guy named Grant Jeffrey and a guy by the name of Jack Van Impe, or Imp, depending on where you come from. But guys who seemed so sure of the end times that they wrote books on it, proclaiming the different signs of the end of the times. Some authors would even go to the extreme and name days. A gentleman by the name of Edgar Wisenant wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. (laughs) Sorry, church. Looks like we missed out. (laughs) Obviously, that didn't happen. Well, at least I don't think it happened. But I have decided to write my own book, and I'm going to unveil it this morning. It's called 13 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 2013. Yeah, you like that, hey? Honorable right, Reverend. I had to do it. I had to do it. I'm not honorable right. I don't have those titles. Just, just in here, I do. Um, and if you're interested in the book, it'll be on sale in the lobby afterwards. You can <laughs> su- support it that way. But in actuality, I kind of rethought writing any book about this because the Old Testament law declares that a prophecy that is given that doesn't come to fulfillment means that prophet should be stoned. So I've uh, decided to recant my book. So sorry for getting your hopes up. But really, it's easy to see why the end times is such an attention grabber. We're all fascinated by the prophecies and the possible, possible events that will unfold. But Christ our coming King is about so much more than just theories about the end of the world. In fact, Christ's second coming has little to do with the end of the world but rather a beginning of a whole new one. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I've often thought of Christ's magnificent return involving me being whisked away into a new body that's sleek and 30 pounds smaller and with golden blonde hair, but I get to keep my red beard because it's perfection. And and just get this whole new transformation of of my body, which is in uh, Scripture. Paul mentions that in Thessalonians. And then I thought I would live somewhere else for eternity. That heaven is beyond the stars, which it very well might be. But the more I read Scripture and the more I read the words of Jesus and the words of Revelation, I see a bigger case being built for Christ's reign on earth culminating in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God here on earth. A new heaven, a new earth. If you're like me, and you've likely had an escapist mentality, which is where we'll be taken away from here and go to heaven somewhere else, when we have this mentality of being whisked away somewhere else, then then we have really no ownership or no reason to effort the kingdom of heaven here, on this earth, to this earth. We have no reason to join these two kingdoms here and now, in the present, because what does it matter? But could it be that the return of our coming king, Jesus, could it be that he is ushering his kingdom in for good when he comes? Now, I'm not a scholar, nor do I have all the answers. I don't know how this is all going to play out. And the Bible really doesn't paint a clear picture. 
But I sure love to think about stuff like this. I don't know if you're like me, maybe this gives you a headache. But I enjoy these kind of discussions, trying to figure this kind of stuff out. But when we talk about Jesus being our coming king, while the prophecies are fascinating and they point to what will happen and the the theories about heaven and Christ's kingdom are abounding all over the place and it doesn't seem like the evangelical church can agree on what this looks like, all this stuff can sometimes distract us from two very important aspects that I want to bring up this morning about the nature of our coming king. And the first aspect is our hope. Our blessed hope. If you have your Bibles, flip them over to Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. If you don't have a Bible, I think the words will be on the screen. Paul writes to Titus, he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good." I would love it if you all would humor me this morning and just stand up. I know we've already greeted people, but just stand up, turn around to a couple of people and say, Maranatha. Yeah, serious. Stand up. Yeah, I wasn't joking around. Once you've done that, you can have a seat. Now, does anyone here know what you just said to somebody? Hands up if you know what Maranatha means. Someone shout it out. Lord, come quickly. quickly, Or the Lord is coming. That is right. So how many of you didn't know that before? So if I told you to stand up and say anything to somebody else, you'd just do it? Is that (laughs) so we can gather from this this morning? (laughs) Oh, that's a lot of trust. (laughs) Maranatha, the Lord is coming. See, back in the older days, early Christians would greet each other with that word, Maranatha, the Lord is coming. And it was a greeting that alluded to the hope that we as Christians have in the coming of our King. When Paul writes to Titus, he makes note of that hope. He talks about both of Jesus' arrivals, his first coming or his first advent that we celebrated just a month ago when he speaks of the grace of God appearing in verse 11. He's referring to Jesus' coming in which we celebrate Christmas. Then when he talks about our blessed hope, he he refers to our coming arrival of Christ the King. See, grace of God appearing or Jesus' birth opened the doors for God's salvation. God's reconciliation between all people and himself. The perfect life of Jesus starting on that day in Bethlehem is the beginning of the bridge that brings God and man together. It is Jesus' road to and the work that he has done on the cross that allows us to overcome the ungodliness, the worldly passions, to live our lives in this age as Paul has instructed Titus. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of what his life, death, and resurrection has done. He has conquered sin and death. And through his death, we have his power and his authority to live our lives here and now. As Paul describes it here, it is through that grace, the person of Jesus, that we have hope. That one day when he appears, however and whenever that happens the world will return to the way God had envisioned it from the beginning. No more sin. No more suffering. No more evil. The hope that we have in Jesus, our coming King, is that he will establish his reign on this world. God incarnate, who entered this world with his first advent, 
in meekness and humility as a baby, according to Scripture, will come again in glory and in victory. Scripture tells us that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, as Carol and the team read earlier. Revelation describes, albeit in confusing detail, the glory and awe of Christ's second coming. Other places in Scripture talk about it. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. Matthew 24, 31, And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Jesus' return will be a triumphant entrance announcing his kingdom, his presence, and his victory over darkness. Our blessed hope rests in the coming of the person of Jesus. So with that hope being in the return of Christ and our lack of ability to know when that will happen, we must maintain a state of readiness. We must live our lives in such a way that we are ready for that moment when Christ does return. Do we have any baseball players in the house? Any baseball players? We have a few. I played a lot of baseball growing up. And uh, baseball, there's a... I call it the rule of imminence. Actually, Pastor Myron calls it the rule of imminence. I stole it from him. But uh, it's called... We call it all kinds of different things. But the rule of imminence suggests that while the pitcher and the catcher are engaged in every single play... The other seven players on the defensive side have to maintain a state of readiness because nobody knows at what point the ball is going to come to them. If you're a third baseman, you have to be be on your game for that quick liner down the line. Or a first baseman, you need to be prepared for that, that throw from the shortstop to throw out the runner. Or second baseman has to get on his horse for a double play. In baseball, while you're not involved in every play, you need to be prepared like you will be. As Christians, we also must employ the rule of imminence. While we shouldn't obsess over Christ's return, we should maintain a level of readiness in our daily lives. We should live our lives in expectancy and in hope of that return. So, obviously, the next question will be, well, what does that look like? Well, that brings us to the second aspect that I want to talk about this morning. In light of our coming king, we have a blessed hope, and that should cause us to move into kingdom action. If you've got your Bibles still open, flip them over to 1 Peter chapter 4. And if you closed your Bible, you can reopen it and turn it to 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter 4, verse 7. Peter says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Here at Harvest Hills, we've been doing an initiative called Maximum Outward Impact. And this truly is the ultimate instruction when it comes to MOI, or our Maximum Outward Impact. In light of our coming King, Peter calls us to action through loving, serving, and showing hospitality to one another. That doesn't just mean the people next to you, to those that you go to church with. Instead, it means everyone our neighbors, our communities, our world. The second coming of Christ is our great motivation to participate in bringing a little taste of God's kingdom to earth in preparation for Christ's visit. The second coming prophecies are not just to point us to the future, but to invite us into participation in the present. 
In one of my textbooks from Bible college, the great theologian Stanley Gren says this, The focus of the prophetic ministry lay in the proclamation of God's message in the present, not in the prediction of the future. In fact, true prophets of God never foretold future events simply to tantalize the imagination of their hearers. Instead, their disclosure of God's future actions served as the basis for issuing a call to obedience in the present. You know, it's quotes like that that kind of make me wish I read the book when I was supposed to. <laughs> I think I might have cracked that book open for the first time this week, but we'll not, we'll not tell her my Bible college professors that. We can spend a lot of time being concerned about how this is all going to play out when really the real meaning behind this is for us to engage in the world around us now with urgency, with sincerity, with love for others. You know, through his ministry, Peter had managed to put himself on Emperor Nero's hit list. He knew that if Christ didn't come back first, he would be a martyr for Christendom. And he was right. But in the face of that uncertainty, his message was that we are to live lives of love to those around us. We should be alert and of clear mind, but that we should love, serve, and show hospitality to those around us. And while his world was ending, Peter still carried the commandment of Christ and now the mission of the church. Love thy neighbor. Serve those around you. Profess Jesus. And through your life, introduce people to the Savior. The commandment and the imminent return of our coming King should be a big part of our motivation for MOI. Now, I have a small confession to give. I don't often live my life thinking about Christ's return. And maybe it's because I've subconsciously convinced myself that it's not going to happen in my lifetime. But what I have convinced myself of, and it's easy to do when you read scripture, is that while Jesus may not have known the date of his return, he made sure that his followers knew that he wanted them to begin to usher in the kingdom of God on earth right up until that day that it becomes a reality. Jesus readily made statements and told parables instructing those close to him to do their part in bringing heaven and earth together now. To live lives that point to God's kingdom. To engage others in love and kindness. To show the world around us what God's, plan, what God's plans for the future entail. We're called to live lives that are free from sin. To alleviate the suffering of those around us by doing all we can to show love, hospitality, and engage the acts of evil and injustice all around us. I want to close our time by saying this. Christ our coming King not only brings blessed hope, but it also brings a call to action. It is a hope and a call for the church and for Christ followers everywhere to be less concerned about what it will be like to go to the kingdom of God and more concerned with making that kingdom a reality here and now on earth. Jesus' second coming ought to be what motivates us to go into those places and show love and compassion that this world desperately needs to see. To step out of our comfort zones. To live lives that serve as a beacon to the world that their hope lies in the King. That one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And he is the only answer to a world that is crying out for something more than just existing. The Christian and Missionary Alliance Statement of Faith says that Christ's second coming or advent will be imminent and visible. We need to live lives that are ready for this return. We need to live lives that are worthy of of the return of the king. Trusting in the hope that his coming brings and taking up our call to action that his coming demands of us.
We live in a world that desperately needs to hear this message. We live in a world that needs the church to act in action out of the blessed hope that they have in Christ's coming. Our world is crying out for it. And our king demands it. Let's pray. Father, I am humbled. I am humbled to be a part of what you're doing in this world. I am humbled to be loved by the King. And I'm humbled for what that King did for me on a cross. Father, I pray that as we head out these doors into the world around us, that we will live with that blessed hope of your second coming or your son's second coming readily available in our minds. That that would motivate us to kingdom action, to show this world a side of the church that they rarely see. One that cares more about helping and serving and loving people than it does about itself. Lord, I pray for strength. I pray for courage. And I pray for obedience for all of us in this room. That when we leave this building, that we will represent you well to the world around us. And that we will live in the hope that we gain from your second coming. Thank you for this time that we can be together. In Jesus' name, amen.